everybody, and welcome to The Wench Bench, where friends sit and talk about fabulous fictional females and how their stories have influenced us throughout our lives. My name is Allison. And my name is Fonda. And today, Fonda is going to be talking about Kuvira from The Legend of Korra. Yes. Can I just first quickly say, it's great to see your face for the first time yeah. since March. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm glad you can be in my, my social bubble. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Here in BC, we are allowed to have a small social circle that we can see again. Still limiting and stuff outside, but we get to see some close people to us, which is pretty pretty fortunate and we're pretty lucky yes we don't hug as much as we used to because i think we're just so used to not physically being (laughs) with other people yeah like no touching (laughs) it's all just like okay hi we're in a space together yes yeah so talking about kuvira which i'm really excited about before i get into like the basic information about her character. Um, Allison, I'm curious if you have a favorite character from either Avatar, The Last Airbender series, or Legend of Korra. I love those shows. I actually had only really watched Avatar, The Last Airbender when I was younger, and it wasn't until about five years ago that I watched through all of Legend of Korra, and it was amazing. Uh, Kuvira is definitely in the tops but i'm completely blanking on her name um Cora's best friend oh 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 asami yes gosh i love her so much and i love all the fanfic of her and Cora. <laughs> i know and just like the fact that it's candid <laughs> yeah yeah and i mean toff is up there too like she's... oh oh yeah hell yeah yeah <laughs> how do you not how do you not like toff Especially old blind top. earthbender. Oh like, my god! Old sassy top. Like oh god, detect she's so lies. Cool. <laughs> Seismic. Se- I'm sorry, but great child and so adult cool. woman. Yeah, her story arc too, and like how they designed her. Like, because she is obviously very protective of herself, and her father's like, oh, she can't do anything, but she's yeah. actually like the most <laughs> badass. <laughs> Um, but then she kind of learns to be a little bit more open with people and just ugh, the storylines in both of the shows are just so incredible. Such I agree. incredible storytelling. So good. Okay. So I'm talking about General Kuvira. Yay. The basic information about her is she is a character from the Legend of Korra series, voiced by Zelda Williams who does a great job, might I add, bringing her character to life. Her first appearance in the show was in episode five of season three, titled The Metal Clan. Mm. She is a member of the Earth Kingdom and can earthbend and metalbend. She is also a former member of the Suyin Bei Fong's like, dance troupe in which they use metal bending to do some really wonderful like dance performances. It's mm-hmm. pretty cool. She was taken in by Suyin Beifong at the age of eight, and the Beifong family in Zhao Fu became her family, basically. Yeah. Some information about Zhao Fu. They are an autonomous city-state located in the southwestern part of the Earth Kingdom and home to the, basically, like, anyone that metal bends. Like, Beifong, Toph Beifong, like, this was her place. Yeah. Like, metal bending clan was the shit here. Because Toph was, was she the first metal bender? Toph was, yes. Yeah. So I, Toph didn't like found the metal clan, like the Zhao Fu one. Um, it was her youngest daughter, Su Yin Bei Fong. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zhao Fu is constructed entirely out of metal and is regarded by some as the safest city in the world. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. even though when I think about it, metal is really sharp and kind of yeah. like, <laughs> a little scary sometimes. But uh, when we first meet Kuvira, she is a captain of the metal clan guard in Zhao Fu. But by book four, she is a general and the main and final antagonist of the series. After succeeding in her goal of stabilizing the Earth Kingdom due to the death of the Earth Queen in book three... Kuvira refused to step down and declared herself the Supreme Empress of the Earth Empire, turning the nation into a totalita- totalitarian. 
Thank you. Turning the nation into a totalitarian <laughs> dictatorship. Yay! <laughs> Great job! <laughs> so Kuvira's actions continuously escalated, as they would, mm -hmm. causing other world leaders to fear she would declare war on other nations, as other people would rightfully be afraid of. Yeah. This earned her the name the Great Uniter by many people in the Earth Kingdom and her followers. That's just general yeah. info. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just basic, like... Like, most people refer to her as, like, the Great Uniter mm -hmm. in the last book, book four, where she is, like, the... You actually get to see her more, because in book three, she's more of a side character, who's really cool. Yeah. And does, like, a lot of cool middle bending, but, like, it's not until later. Um, one thing I didn't know about, because it's not really in the show, so I have to do research, because a book series came out that provided a lot more back story information like early history stuff about Kuvira cool which I'm gonna get into because I actually think it's quite important to know because it at least informed me a lot more about her yeah sadly even though there was a mini comic book run that came out that provided us a little bit more about Kuvira we don't know much about Kuvira's past in the show itself the only information we have is that she was abandoned by her parents at a young age and Suyin Beifeng took her in however the comic book series a three-part graphic novel titled Ruins of the Empire um, it came out May 21st 2019 and it ended with part three on February 26 2020 gives us like a lot more in regards to Kavira as a character since the end of the show as the comics unfold we see how Kavira was un was a very unruly child uh, who often butted heads with her parents. Once when she broke a vase, her parents took away all of her toys. Aww. In protest, Kuvira earthbended a hole in the wall and ran <laughs> off. <laughs> the next flashback reveals Kuvira's parents dropping her off in Zalfu as Suyin's ward, with her parents hoping Suyin would whip her into shape. However, Kuvira struggled to feel like a part of the family especially because she overhears her foster sister, Opal. Do you remember Opal? I do. I, yeah. I really like Opal. But, I mean, she's not perfect, as I found out in this little comic book series. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Opal compares her to a stray dog that nobody wants. Oh, I know. And yes, unfortunately, Kavir's parents seemingly never returned for her. But in the comics, we find out some reasoning as to why that may be. Hmm. Yeah, because though at first it seems Kuvira's parents simply gave up on their child after she misbehaved, Kuvira confesses that at one point, losing her temper as a child nearly killed her own mother. Oh no. Leaving Kuvira with Suyin was not just an act of neglection on their part, but it could have also been one of self-preservation, I think. Um, this information gives new light on Kavira's struggles to fit in with the Beifong siblings, but also kind of like, I think, gives more information about her past because clearly she was really troubled and I don't think it was right that they just gave up on her. Yeah. But I can also understand that if you have a child who is clearly really strong with both earth bending and metal bending, yeah. that if it nearly kills you, it could really, I think, have you make rash decisions for self-preservation. Yeah, and were her parents benders? It doesn't say, like, there's not much to go on besides the fact that, one, took away her toys, she broke a hole in the wall, two, something bad happened, Kuvira almost killed the parents, and then three, the parents dropped her off with Suin Beifong and never came to get her. Yeah. Like, that's kind of all that's really currently that we know of. Yeah, because what I, a lot of the themes that I remember from Legend of Korra was a lot of disparity between benders versus non-benders. Yeah, yeah, And yeah, so yeah. I feel like maybe if her parents weren't benders, the idea of being afraid of somebody, even your child, who has those kind of excessive powers can be really understandable in a way. I mean, that theme is in things like X-Men and a bunch of other stuff, too. Oh, it's for like, sure. If you don't understand, how can you relate to your child and how you, how can you help them learn? Yeah, right? you, you can't. Mm -hmm. 
So there was actually an article written by Brenton Stewart titled Legend of Korra, Kuvira's Backstory Will Bring You to Tears. Oh. He brings up a lot of good points in regards to her backstory. For example, in the end of his article, he says, Though this backstory could easily be used to explain away the innate evil or sociopathy. Did I say that right? Sociopathy? Uh, I see sociopathy, but... Because so, it's sociopath, <laughs> right? Like, Yeah. So it's, you can cut this out, but I'm just saying it's a little The confusing. discussion of the word sociopathy. <laughs> Anyways, of a different villain with Kuvira, it actually makes her more sympathetic and a little bit engaging. Kuvira proves during Ruins of the Empire she is capable of change. And understanding her past as a neglected, unruly, and outcast child who was treated with fear rather than love helps fans to see just how she sank to such moral depths in the first place. Mm -hmm. Though there may be no forgiving some actions as a villain undertakes... In watching them grow and in understanding their origins, it's possible to see how a character has more dimensions to them beyond some villainous moments. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty good article if you really like Kuvira. Yeah. I suggest reading it. I thought it was informative and insightful, and I liked that last part, which is why I quoted it. Yeah. It was, it was a great quote, and I think that it brings up a lot of other great topics about why she is such an engaging and deep character is because there are more depths to her as a person and it's like not necessarily how she was created but it leads into that feeling of this is a reason it's not an excuse Mm -hmm. her history is the reason why she is who she is and the decisions she made exactly but it doesn't excuse how much she hurt people yeah so i find that very interesting that they put that in there and kind of fleshed it out a bit more yeah i think both with legend of korra and avatar the last airbender i believe they do a really good job of providing information for a lot of characters that are complex and could be evil or bad yeah like oh gosh i'm the worst with names zuko's sister oh son of a bitch azula (laughs) azula 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 frick that mm. So good. The sh- I know. <laughs> and for such a young girl to be so intimidating and powerful and scary, it's like... Yeah. And then you find out that her mom, she felt like her mom never loved her. And all this stuff added to why she's also kind of unstable. And the reason she does things is to gain approval of her father. Yeah. We're going to get so many episodes out of... <laughs> Just from this series alone. <laughs> out of these two shows. Like, cause... Toph. Definitely want to talk about Katara. The... Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, like, I think it would be fun to do an episode on all three, Azula, Ty Lee, and May. Like, oh, all three of them together. Oh, yeah, the trio. Their little relationship and the way that they kind of work together and how they branch off at the end is just so... So fascinating. <laughs> no, I agree. Now I want to get to Kuvira in the show. Mm, yes. Like the the I think what people most know her from. Yes. Yeah. I personally never read the comics. I had to do like a TLDR synopsis <laughs> kind of because I just couldn't. One, couldn't go out and purchase them during yes. COVID. <laughs> and two, there's a lot of places online that are like, oh, we can't sell this to you in your country. And I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so the show is most accessible. Like, it's everyone can freaking yeah, watch it. Yeah, it's on, like, Netflix. <laughs> yeah. So as I said earlier, we were first introduced to Kuvira in episode five of book three. And as a citizen of Zaofu, she helps in the fight against Zahir, the book three's villain. The oh, guy yeah, yeah. who was part of the Red Lotus, mm-hmm. opposite of the White Lotus. Very much anti-Avatar. Yeah. So she's helping with that fight, and she even tends to the injured in the show for that season. And the way she is shown in this season is to be, she comes off like entirely average, in my opinion, in, and in a good way. Yeah. She seems both kind and responsible, and maybe the show has a reason for showing her that way in that season. It takes viewers off guard, in my opinion. Like, it took me off guard in book four when we realized that she is the new and final antagonist. Mm-hmm. Because 
there wasn't much to go off of in season three for her. But what we did see was that like she was helping the Avatar. She did a lot of stuff because she was being a good person and she was part of a metal clan with the Beifong family who seemed to be very neutral in a lot of stuff, but obviously are supportive and helpful and trying to do right yeah. by people in the world all over. And so she seemed so average. Mm-hmm. So it really took me off guard. Because when she, when you find out she's the antagonist, I was like, oh. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, no. Like, you know what oh, I no. mean? <laughs> you live long enough to see yourself become a villain is how I kind of felt about her. Yeah. I was like, oh. No. Ah. Uh, one of the things, too, though, is that it kind of makes you question, like, at that time, was she planning on going ahead or on, like, going ahead with her plans and her lovely <laughs> everything that she does or was the structure of like the military and all those things was that like helpful for her because there are some times when like people do better in like a structured environment and then Mm -hmm. once she gets promoted to a point where she no longer has where she has a little bit more freedom and a little less of the rigid structure now all of a sudden she could possibly have more power and like the other trope like absolute power corrupts absolutely right all of a sudden she has more power and she's like well i don't want to give this up like very caesar (laughs) yeah i don't think she started off at all and again it's hard to say because she was a side character that Mm -hmm. we didn't get much of in season three but there was a point in season four book four where she goes up to Suyin, I believe, after, like, you know, the monarchy's kind of dead, the prince in the show doesn't seem like he's going to be a good leader, I believe she goes up and she, like, talks to Suyin about her taking over. Yeah. And Suyin says, no. No. <laughs> and I believe that kind of caused a rift because I think the Beifong family, especially Su Yin, was kind of like a moral guiding compass. Yeah. But when Kuvira saw that they both had different viewpoints on this one thing, she kind of just like pieced out. Yeah. And so I think she lost a moral compass. Yeah. And perhaps Su Yin saw that a potential of villainy mm-hmm. and was like, no, like, this will lead you down a bad path, but then it ended up pushing her down that path anyways, yeah. which is just one of those, like, <laughs> lovely, classic things. like, classic villain stories, yep. which is just so good. <laughs> um, it's not clear in season four, but you know what happens. We just don't know when. But mm-hmm. Kavira changed from the Zalfu guard rescuing Tonrock. Chorus father to the dictator who fired a spirit cannon indiscriminately upon Republic City and created concentration camps, basically. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to compare it to real life concentration camps. Yeah. But I've read enough of fan input online when the show first aired that a lot of people are like, wow, what she's doing is in some ways similar yeah. to concentration camps. So. We don't see this part of her journey. Like, after book three to book four, we don't see that journey. She's just suddenly the head general of the Earth Empire, and she is doing a good fucking job. Like, she's helping people because the queen was dead, and there's a lot of people in the Earth Empire who were being left behind on the sidelines, and she was giving them food and bringing resources and stuff. So, like, we don't see that. Yeah. And but you, we know she's done it because yeah. of, like, character voicing stuff and how things have gone. Yeah, and you definitely see a bit of that, like, I don't know whether or not the writers were specifically inspired by that, like, but, like, Hitler started out helping Germany and then, like, rapidly declined to destroying it. Like, that's how he came to power and he just never gave it up. Mm -hmm. And, like, Hitler clearly had fucking (laughs) other plans. (laughs) But it's a very... I can totally see how people can see the same kind of story or, like, kind of reference. Like, a nod to... That type of leadership. Like, that type of leadership and how, like, that's how they enticed people into following them. Is Mm -hmm. that, like, somebody who starts off evil, how can you raise an army and get people to trust you and put you into power if yeah. you start out being like all of these people <laughs> like because it's it's non-benders that was it non-benders not in book were? four not in book four sorry that's, that was that's book later. one that was with Amon yes he was yeah. the one that like fuck benders 
taken away your power with my blood bending because she was secretly a water bender, which lost all of his followers because the whole point of Amon's arc was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, equalists. Like they equalists, wanted to be equal. Yes. So yeah, so yeah, like not not that, but the the idea of like a an us versus them kind of thing, how you bring people in and pretend like you're helping everybody, but it's all for the wrong reasons. Like it's steeped in our history on planet earth and Mm -hmm. it's just fascinating getting to see it represented in different ways yeah uh while i was refreshing myself on kuvira watching season three and season four i also researched some of the previous antagonists in the series to help me explain better why i like her as a character Mm -hmm. there is one article in particular that i found called the legend of korra emphasizing with villains and it was released uh november 2016 by an author who has a handle but didn't provide no actual name so her hand his or her handle there there i don't know <laughs> is afro fin to pisces a p r o s a i c p i n t double o f Pisces is the cool. handle. <laughs> uh, anyways. Yeah, usernames uh, are really getting snatched up real quick. Yeah. <laughs> People uh, get creative. <laughs> but it was for a, a website that has a lot of good articles called The Artifact. Cool. Um, this person does a really good job at diving into all of the antagonists from the series, but I especially like their analysis on Kavira. This author words some of my own muddled thoughts and opinions much better than I could. So I'm going to provide some quotes as points for Kavira as an antagonist. Cool. Yeah, I got a lot. Because again, this person just like pretty much everything I was thinking, I'm like, oh, they did it. Yeah. <laughs> they already did it. I love it when you find stuff like that where you're just like, oh, like that was in my brain and I couldn't get it on the page and you did it. <laughs> So I'm gonna work cite you and make sure you're 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 given your credit. <laughs> Anyways, the first quote is with Kuvira, viewers see a distorted funhouse mirror of Korra's traits, displaced by a military leader. Kuvira is an obvious riff on overzealous dictators. She wants to restore the Earth Kingdom to its supposed former glory, but believes only she has the leadership it takes to get it there. Sound familiar? Just a titch. Just As a titch. the Avatar, Korra is meant to do much the same thing. Even Korra realizes Kavira is taking over her job as the Avatar while she's been busy recuperating from her fight with Zaheer. The only difference is that, as the Avatar, Korra owes her allegiance to all nations and all people, whereas Kavira is solely concerned with the Earth Kingdom at the expense of all outsiders. Mm-hmm. This quote, I think, does a great job at comparing Kuvira, the only female antagonist in the series. This series, obviously, yeah. we know that Azula is a female antagonist, um, mm-hmm. but they compare her with Korra, and I often appreciate a good character foil. <laughs> so seeing these two be that, I didn't personally recognize it. Like, I didn't see it when I first watched the series. Yeah. But I can definitely understand it because she is. Kuvira is so strong. She is really good at bending. She's got a lot of skills and she does at one point in the book defeat Korra in just a fight. Yeah. Which like anyone has been shown to defeat the Avatar. Like yes. yeah, just because the Avatar is the Avatar doesn't mean they're all powerful or anything. O- OP. Except for What's her face? The one who came up with, like, the painting dancing once. That avatar. Uh, She lived for, like, 300 years because she's just so so stubborn she didn't want to die. (laughs) Oh. Uh, I I have to look it up. I have to. Avatar. Fuck me. (laughs) She's another woman I want to talk about. I know. She's so cool. Avatar. Avatar. Kiyoshi. Kiyoshi. Avatar Kiyoshi. Avatar Kiyoshi. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, what's the island? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so cool and like her whole yeah. tribe of like women uh, I know uh. she's a badass she okay she could kick ass at any yeah. point in time <laughs> but Kabira, I think is 
I didn't think of her as being a character foil, but I really like that idea. Mm -hmm. I think that comes up a lot too in like rewatches and stuff, because the first time you watch something, a lot of times you're just like, yay, (laughs) enjoying it. Yeah. Uh, And then every time you watch it again after that, a lot of times you pick up different things and you get different stuff out of it. I love stories that you can rewatch and re enjoy and learn new stuff. Yeah. I also feel the same way. (laughs) Same. Uh, Next quote. Kuvira perceives herself as a generous and benevolent leader. But as Toph points out to Korra, that is a dangerous mode of thinking. The issues that routinely plague mankind are far too big for any one person to assume they can fix. And, you know, like most people who believe they are benevolent, they often believe they are the exception to the rule that they're not going to turn out like their previous... Yep. People who also thought the same. Yep. <laughs> and a little bit of pride there. Yeah, a, a little, little bit, bit of avarice. like. Oh, not avarice, just pride. Yeah. Hubris? Hubris. That's the one. <laughs> hey, I was like, words. avarice is greed. <laughs> <laughs> What's the other word? <laughs> Hubris. <laughs> Hubris. I mean, avarice too. She's greedy for power and. Yeah, she's greedy for the empire. Yeah. Which, at one point in the series, and also in the um, comic books, I don't remember the exact quote, so I'm just paraphrasing from what I can remember, but Kavira talks about how, with the the monarchy abandoning the, the Earth Kingdom, reminded her of her parents abandoning her. Oh, yeah. And so she felt like this was her calling, basically. Yeah. I, I feel like... It can be expressed, and it's never explicitly stated, but if, like, if you see people being abandoned by someone who's supposed to take care of you, and yeah. you have that same experience with parents, like, I can understand how she would feel like she needs to come in and be there for her people. Yeah. It all makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yes. Were her decisions good? No. No. Did they have a reason? Yes. Yes. I don't agree with it, but I <laughs> understand how it got there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The next quote, this is a little longer one, so I apologize. No worries. Uh, Kavira also believes the monarchy is an outdated system. Not unlike Adolf Hitler's rationale of restoring Germany's bruised pride after the First World War, Kavira will do whatever it takes to make sure the Earth Kingdom will never be mocked or hurt again. She even goes so far as to dub the Earth Kingdom as the Earth Empire instead Mm. echoing the symbol of the third reich yes yep yep as we talked about before yep continue similar continuing the quote (laughs) like any dictator and all of Korra's previous enemies kavira goes too far she operates on a join or die policy reabsorbing territories into her earth empire through intimidation and wiping out any that stand against her oh Siphoning supplies from those who don't bow to her rule, she bends the opposition until it breaks. Even those who willingly submit to authority don't flourish. Instead, they turn into slave labor camps. She amasses her own private army, and with inventor Varric's help... Do you remember Varric? I do. I love him. He's so funny. I know. Um, Anyways, with his help, builds a super weapon at the expense of the spirit vines from the foggy swamp. Yes. As with Unalak, Kavira messes with powers she can't control. These are all the unsettling symptoms of an emerging totalitarian government. Yeah. So, in my opinion, this part in the article really hit home to me mm-hmm. in, in what made... Because I didn't understand it at the time, but Kavira made me uncomfortable. Yeah. But I didn't know why, because I still found her charismatic, which is... It's a key to being able to reach a dictatorship. Yeah. People need to want to follow you. And that's the unfortunate part about what happens with so much evil in this world is that the people who are doing this evil are so, like, they have the ability to do that because they have the ability to manipulate people. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But again, like, she made me uncomfortable, but I found her charismatic, and I... During book four, I wanted to know more. Like, that's why I can, you know, not only did I want to see how the end of the series went, but I wanted to more about her. She has characteristics that echo a figure in our world's history that, at the core, makes me uncomfortable. Yep. 
But because she is a part of a fictional world and I can take a step back and enjoy it for the media that it is, that uncomfortableness I feel after her in season four is at first, overshadowed by her charismaticness and what we did see of her in season three, yeah. which was, again, appear to be an average, kind, responsible female guard who is helping the Avatar take down Zaheer, who is also a really good metal bender. Yeah, and that's the important part, too, is that being able to understand that this is fiction. It might take yeah. from real life. But understanding the difference between fiction and nonfiction, like yeah. with things like Star Wars, it's like clearly, like, look at the uniforms, look at the design. Clearly it is designed after, like, the German army. Like, it's, yeah. but it's supposed to hit that point in your brain where you don't need to be told that they're the bad guys. Yeah. So it's used in a way to take those already learned information all of that stuff that you already know from real life mm -hmm. and transfer it onto the screen without having to explain it to you yeah so it's really good storytelling but you can still enjoy it because it's not real yes but yeah like knowing that difference but still having storytellers be able to use that in a incredible way oh, to like yeah. get those feelings across and to make you feel uncomfortable because you're like oh like <laughs> she's so cool like god she's so evil <laughs> i know <laughs> like uh, it's so good it is next quote from the article again it's a good article it is you should go read it because it doesn't just talk about kavira it talks about all of them amon unalak zahir like go i really suggest reading it if you like the legend of korra antagonists yeah and definitely just watch the show because like very good they deal with so many different like themes. real world themes yeah. in such an incredible way. I agree. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, so Kuvira may appear to be a cool and calculating villain on the outside, but much like Princess Azula of Avatar The Last Airbender, uh -huh. there exists deep resentment and anger beneath the facade. In the series finale, Kavira reveals the unlikely connection between her desire for world conquest and her personal background. The now scattered Earth Kingdom is a painful reminder of her rootlessness as an orphan, feeling unwanted and having to construct and carve out her identity all on her own. In Korra's final showdown with Kavira, viewers witness a much matured and level-headed woman facing the impetuous teenager she once was. It's no wonder Kavira is the only main female antagonist of the series to make her and Korra's connection clear at the end. Yeah. Oh, man. One day I want to, or we need to get a guest on the show to talk about Azula because, oh boy, is she a really good female villain to explore and a much younger character villain as well. She is like 14 at the start of the series yeah. and like 16... No, because it, it lasts a year. So like 14, maybe 15 turning 16 by the end. Anyways, back to discussing Kavira. Yeah, like... <laughs> The depth yeah. that they reach with these characters is so impressive. Yeah. And for such a short show, like, yeah. these are, this is a children's show, and it's getting these themes across in, like, 25-minute episodes. You don't get a lot of time to explore, but you still get the depths of these characters, and I think that it, it does have to do with the good writing and the way that they use real-world themes because mm -hmm. you already understand like where she's coming from like they use a lot of things that people can connect with like that feeling of being left behind that feeling of wanting to do something important and wanting, wanting to, to help be your country exactly like wanting to be recognized like it's an easy way to connect with her mm -hmm. but also we understand that that's not good that the actions that she took yeah. were not good but you can understand why it is that she wanted that so bad and it's just so incredible to be able to connect in such a short period of time especially for again a kids show like <sighs> I know frick <laughs> yep 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 no words like uh, so good oh boy uh, so now that I've given <laughs> back 
facts. Like, I gave general basic info. I gave, like, early history stuff. And then I dived into the show. Now I actually want to tell you why I like her. Yes. <laughs> Not that we haven't already had, like, a bunch of tangents and shit already. But yeah. <laughs> I just, like, because she's complex and, like, even though she's only in it for part of book three and she's the antagonist for book four, there was a lot to, like, unpack with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And again, she's a she's a villain. She's a antagonist. Yes. And sometimes I feel when you talk about an antagonist, you have to give more information to explain why you might like them. Yeah. Right. So first off, I am unsure if we said this earlier in the episodes, but I really want to hit home here that there is nothing wrong with liking villains in fiction. Nope. Liking a villain is proof that whomever that character is, they are a well written character. Exactly. Just putting that out there yeah anyways so like sure some villains are self-serving and in it to further their own position and pleasure but there are some villains who despite their wayward approach aren't entirely corrupt yeah like a big one is thanos which which we talked about before we have it's because he's like really relevant in terms of like media and and movies he was extremely well written, in my opinion, and a lot of people like him. They may not agree with him at the end of the day, but he was written to show us a point. Sanath's goal is to rebalance the universe. Yes, he wipes out half of our life in existence and loads of our favorite superheroes to achieve that bad. Yeah. But he was trying to stop the cosmos from being overrun and running out of resources, which is a good yeah. thing. Like, you want people to not run out of resources. So, like, he has a good... <laughs> like, there's a good uh, 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 core, yeah. but everything else is bad. Yeah, it went about it the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> because, like, he's shown that he's suffered that himself when you watch his home planet wither and die away. Yeah. And as an audience, we can understand why he wants to do this horrible thing. And when you have those complex villains, the ones who have something that you can also relate to, even when you know they're wrong, you understand the anger or something in particular that has has pushed them over the edge, even when you see them doing horrible things. Yeah. And well, there's a huge, huge difference between liking a character and thinking that what they did was good. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Vast space between those two points mm-hmm. because you can enjoy watching them. I love Catherine Phasma, as we've talked about. Yeah. She's awesome. <laughs> she has no redeeming qualities. <laughs> She's a monster. <laughs> a lot but... of people like the Joker. He is very bad. Horrible. Very, 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 very. Very bad. <laughs> I don't think he can do anything to redeem himself. He's he's so bad. He's the fucking worst. <laughs> but he's interesting, and he gets you thinking, and he like like he challenges the good people. He does, and like <laughs> heading in that challenge and having these villains make you question where morals shift. Yeah. It's like how far can you go with this good plan, this in theory good idea before you take it to a point where it's bad. Yeah. Like sometimes that line is further than other times, but it makes you question that, it makes you think about that, and it makes you want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so good. <laughs> I know. I so like I really believe that Kuvira starts out the same. Mm -hmm. as like Thanos to go back to him her goal is to help rebuild the earth kingdom after the queen was murdered good goal Mm -hmm. right after she helps many cities and towns she realizes that the earth kingdom prince is not fit to serve the kingdom I kind of agree he is not shown to be the best uh, up and coming leader and I think maybe that's how he was raised maybe no one taught him stuff early on because maybe they thought his mother was going to live longer that he had more time to learn politics like I don't I don't know but I have to or maybe he was just a privileged little shit who didn't want to learn anything (laughs) that's there's a lot of points to a lot of things um and the show kind of portrays the prince I also agree that he hasn't 
You know, I, I agree that I don't think he would be fit to lead yet. Yeah. And, I mean, that comes down to just the general idea of, like, inherited power being yeah. absolute bullshit. He's so, incompetent. I'm sorry. Yeah. He's funny, and I like how he and Mako <laughs> interact, but he's he is kind of incompetent. Yeah. And I think he gets better near the end, but he really yeah. is incompetent at the start. Yeah, like many characters in the show, I think he does, like, grow and mature. Yeah, but so. the citizens see his incompetence, <laughs> and then they see how Kuvira is helping and in control and has proven herself a stronger leader. So of course other people agree and align with her. Because when you see someone doing better, you want to vote for them, right? Yes! <laughs> but this inherent good of wanting to restore the Earth Kingdom goes sour because of her methods. Yes. And I really enjoy that. Like, she started out as a character we liked because of how we perceived her in season three. And this perception we had of her made it easy for us to teeter on the edge of understanding her views and not understanding her views because of the way she tackled them. She made me uncomfortable. And because I found her charismatic and I deep down, I wanted her to do right by her nation. But the more we saw her sink deeper into the dark hole of a villain, the more I found myself being challenged mentally with my own views and opinions for a fictional show. And in turn, real life events and how charismatic leaders are fucking scary. Yes. And people with lots of power have greater responsibilities to be better people. <laughs> Because if you have that much power, you have a responsibility to those people that you have power over. You have to think of them first. Yeah. And I think that gets lost a lot in all levels of, of government. Politics. Yeah. It's, it's hard. <laughs> it is. Like, I don't blame... I was watching a romantic comedy with Seth Rogen and Charlize Theron. I can't remember what the name of it's called. I literally watched it last night. Oh, yeah. But Charlize Theron's character is, you know, wanting to be the next president. She's secretary of state. Yeah. She wants to be the first female president. Awesome. And it's shown that when she was a kid, like, she made no compromises to do good things. Like, she wanted to make a really good recycling system for her high school, and Seth Rogen's character remembered it, but is seeing that she's making these compromises because there's pe other people in politics that hold power, like this old white man who's blackmailing her... And telling her no for this environmental change, she has to remove the trees from her goal, from her policy, oh. because they want to take up this huge portion of land in Alaska. But she doesn't want to be blackmailed because she wants to run for president, because she wants to do better. So she says yes, and Seth Rogen is like, you wouldn't have done this when you were younger. Yeah. And, like, it, it does a good job at, like, explaining that there's a lot of things where even people who want to do good yeah. un make unfortunate compromises. Mm -hmm. She doesn't in the end. She says, fuck you to everybody. And she's like, I'm being blackmailed by this guy, and the president sucks. And, yes, they're going to release a video of the man I'm in love with jacking off. But you know what? <laughs> that was like, <laughs> cool. She's like, fuck this. And she leaves. And then she, at the end of the show, she ends up becoming the first female president. Nice. Um, but it's a good example of like yes, it's also a to great good. fiction <laughs> because <laughs> the unfortunate part is in reality she wouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, and we saw that happen. Uh, <laughs> and like it's something that's really great to believe and obviously to be like, like stick to your convictions and stay who you are. And I understand that. It's easier said than done to say, like, oh, well, our politicians just need to be better. But, like, even something as simple as when I ran for city council, like, that's city fucking council. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not anything huge. But, like, having people question your ideas and your plans and being like, well, why does that matter? Or, like, why do you care about this? Or, like, all of these things and tearing down the ideas that you have and knowing that you have to make compromises as a person who is not a white guy. <laughs> like, so much of this comes down to things like being a woman in that 
movie that you're talking about that I haven't seen, but like it's good. It it's added pressure on them, and then I'm rewatching Brooklyn Nine Nine, and we just watched the episode where Terry Jeffords, Terry Cruz's character, mm. uh, gets arrested, and it touches on a lot of like common themes right now. But when Terry wants to bring it forward, Captain Holt, who is also a black man, is like, well, like you shouldn't do that because that could affect your career. And it's like, but I'm fighting racism, but it's like I have to take the it into account that it might not be okay for me to do that. And like and then Captain Holt ends up being won over and they do report the guy, but maybe something negative happened to Terry because he didn't get, like, a promotion, I think Mm -hmm. it was. But it's, like, the need to still fight is still there, and I think that a lot of, like, shows and stuff are kind of bringing that up, that it's, like, as long as we are together as a group and as long as, like, we all are fighting for the betterment of the world, we can maybe make it happen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And hopefully we can get some, like, politicians and stuff on our side (laughs) and change things a little bit more. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but there's still so much corruption and stuff. But in the shows, it's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's because it's fictional. Because it's <laughs> fictional, and it's just like, ooh, let's just get the Avatar to go and kick some butt. <laughs> yep, the Avatar does that. Um, and, uh... Speaking of the Avatar, that's why I like Kavira. <laughs> <laughs> so, Allison, before we end off the show, what are you excited about? Okay. I'm excited, even though I'm so ashamed of myself. <laughs> I have Amazon Prime, which, as I've definitely said before... The I think show I'm... I watched that I can't remember the name of is on Amazon Prime. Okay. <laughs> um, but I have Amazon Prime, which I'm so ashamed of because I don't like giving Amazon my money. <laughs> I know. Um, but it is going to give me the opportunity to watch the new animated show because you can buy uh, additional channels on Amazon Prime because I don't have TV. Yes. And so you can buy them for really cheap. So I've I been heard able to... I can get the Food Network. Yeah. That's and what I heard. I've been able to watch Out TV, so I've been keeping up on all my RuPaul, which has been amazing throughout all of quarantine. It's been just the light of my life. But also, I get to watch the animated Harley Quinn show that oh, I'm so excited about. The it's new like, one that has swear words. <laughs> the new one that has swear words. Um, and I'm waiting until season three is done so I can like binge it all right away. But it's like almost over and I'm so excited to watch it because I've been wanting to watch it for forever because apparently it has like an incredible portrayal of Harley who I love and it has like poison ivy in it and apparently they're like in love too um (laughs) so I've read so much good things about it I'm so excited to watch it and get to actually like be excited and Allison's vibrating so I can tell she's excited (laughs) I'm so excited when I found out that that was like on one of the sub channels I was just scrolling through one day and I was like holy fuck this is amazing and I'm just so impatiently waiting for the whole season to be out can I quickly make a drop I know we don't normally do this, but can I make a, a drop of something I'm excited for? Yeah, Because yeah. speaking of Amazon, Amazon Prime, <laughs> it allows me to subscribe on Twitch. Yes. Critical Role is back July 2nd. Mm. And I'm very excited about it. Critical Role is coming back. I really like the show, and I think it sounds like the procedures they are taking to come back is awesome. And we've recently got our friend Ben into it and he's been like watching every day he just got to the part where they met caduceus's family allison oh you can cut this part out but it's really great yeah. seeing him talk about it he's like i don't think jester is going to be able to piece back a broken statue of caduceus's family and i'm just like i didn't know how to respond because i'm like however i respond it could tip him off that yeah. she does do this incredible feat yeah. so i just sent it sippy tea emoji <laughs> and i'm excited because he's gonna... a little yoda holding a cup <laughs> yeah, so I'm excited because he's gonna be caught up, and mm-hmm. and it's um I don't know I like exploring stuff and tabletop, and I know it's not always perfect, and but it's like a I don't know it, I enjoy fun. it for what it is, yeah, and and I think it's okay to just in, do that in, sometimes enjoy stuff for I don't know that's why I freaking love cooking shows. <laughs> <laughs> Cooking shows are great for that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm excited about Harley Quinn and Fonda loves Kuvira and 
Avatar and Korra are some of the most amazing children's television ever created. <laughs> really good. So good. Really like them. Um... Uh, and you can find us wherever podcasts can be found. Please make sure to rate and subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow us on Tumblr, Twitter, and Instagram at WenchBenchPod. And if you want to reach out, you can send us an email at WenchBenchPod at gmail.com. All of the art for The Wench Bench was designed by the wonderful Tessa Joyce Reakin. You can find her on Twitter at Wherevile. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. Bye! Bye! Anyway, so Kuvu... 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 Kuvira...